Heavenly Father, as we're coming to the close of the day, we ask that you would strengthen us to um, finish off the study that we're, that's underway and uh, help it continue to have clarity and consistency um, with your principles, with your ideas. We want to understand the message of the hour in such a way that we can convincingly share with those around us what's happening in the world today. And we understand from your word that these events that are taking place have been illustrated in the histories of the past, and we ask for your blessing upon our attempts to come to grips with these things. We thank you for being with us so far. Once again, ask for your spirit and angels to be in attendance, and we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so, I didn't quite get through the last presentation. And uh, what I was trying to emphasize there is that the relationship between paganism and papalism is the primary subject of Bible prophecy in terms of identifying God's enemy. There are pas passages in Bible prophecy that are dealing with God's people and God's truth. But when it comes to dealing with God's enemy, the history of the relationship between pagan Rome and papal Rome is the history that is most often discussed in the books of Daniel and Revelation. So, um, if you turn to page uh, 76 at the top, remember we read a quote from Sister White where she talks about the future fulfillment of Daniel 11, which would be verses 40 to 45. Then she quotes verses 30 to 36 and says, seemed similar to those described in verses 30 to 36, that's my paraphrase, will be repeated, will take place. In verse 30, verse 30 clo comes to a conclusion with the intelligence, the communications, the dialogue, the interaction between pagan Rome and papal Rome. And from that point on, papal Rome becomes the subject of Daniel 11, from verse 31 onward, and arms in verse 31 are going to stand up for the papacy, and they're going to accomplish three things, they're going to, four things if you want to include the standing up. They're going to stand up for the papacy, they're going to pollute the sanctuary of strength, they're going to take away the daily, they're going to place the abomination that make it desolate. In the book of Daniel, there are a few words that are very important to understand correctly. But you, it's very difficult to understand them correctly unless you get into a concordance and realize that they're different Hebrew words. One of the two words that, that um, I'm not sure about the spelling of the Hebrew, so I'm going to get close. Don't hold me um, to the spelling. I think this is a Q. Makdesh and Kodesh in the book of Daniel. Both are translated as what? Sanctuary. Sanctuary. Now, if we're going to understand the sanctuary of strength in verse 31, then we're going to have to deal with this word translated as sanctuary. They're both sanctuary. But in the Bible, when Kodesh is used and translated as sanctuary, it can only be God's sanctuary, period. In the Bible, Kodesh is God's sanctuary. It may be his sanctuary on earth, maybe his sanctuary in heaven, but this is God's sanctuary. Whereas Makdesh can be, can it, can be God's sanctuary, can it, but it can also be a pagan sanctuary. Okay, that's two words in the book of Daniel that we need to come to grips with. Two other words are sir and room. And sir is t translated as take away. And room is translated as take away. Now, in Daniel 11, verse 31, Sir is translated as take away. And in Daniel 12, verse 11, it's also sir. 
But in Daniel 8, 11, the, word that you, the two words take away in Daniel 8, 11 is room. Different Hebrew word. Now, both these words are used in the Bible to illustrate actions in the sanctuary. Sir is the word that is used to illustrate when the, they would come to the, the altar of burnt offering and they would get the ashes that have built up underneath the altar and they would take them away. They would sir them. They would physically remove those ashes. That's what sir means. It means to remove, take away. It's used in the sanctuary. This is easy, right? Some of you that have some questions about the daily, I hope you're taking this down. This room, it means to lift up and exalt. That's the primary definition. Now, those people that want to teach that the daily represents Christ's work in the heavenly sanctuary, they teach that both sir and room both mean remove. And their argument is this, the logic is this, is if I take the Bible and I lift it up and exalt it, there is a sense where I have removed the Bible from this podium. So there, there is a sense to this room that there is a removal. But room is used in the sanctuary when the priest would take a wave offering and he would lift it up and exalt it before the Lord. He would room it. He wouldn't stir it. He wouldn't remove it. He would lift it up and exalt it. That's the primary definition of um, room. Now the question is, do you believe that this minor secondary definition of room, the fact that it was taken up, lifted up and exalted, and in that sense taken away, should we apply a more obscure meaning, remove, to room, or stick with the primary definition of room? Do you follow the dilemma? This is one of the dilemmas on the study of the daily. Do you see the dilemma that I'm setting up on this subject? Follow the logic? So when you have this kind of dilemma, do these two, two words really mean the same thing? For me, I'm simple-minded. If Daniel used two different words, it means that Daniel's making a distinction between these two different actions. Okay, that's the first rule of thumb. But there is some confusion on the subject. So the first place you go is you see, you ask yourself, does Daniel use the word room anywhere else in his writing? So he does. Let's take a look at how Daniel understands the word room. Because if you do that, um, you tend to get an idea of what the meaning of it is. In verse 12 of Daniel 11, verse 12 of Daniel 11, talking about a king, one of the last kings of the north before pagan Rome comes into history. It says, um, when, and when he hath taken away the multitude, his heart shall be roomed. His heart shall be roomed. And what does it say there? His heart will be lifted up. Okay, Daniel thinks the word room, he doesn't think it means remove. He thinks it will be lifted up, at least here in verse 12. Do you follow the logic? The word that is translated as lifted up in verse 12 of Daniel 11 is room. There's another place where Daniel uses it. It's in verse 36 of Daniel 11. Verse 36 of Daniel 11. This is where Uriah Smith went astray. We'll deal with that later, Lord willing. It says, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself. This word exalt is room. He shall room himself. The primary meaning of room is to Lift up and exalt. So here in verse 12 of Daniel 11, Daniel uses room to portray lifting up. In verse 36, he uses room to portray exalt. He uses it one other place. Daniel 12, verse 7. Daniel 12, verse 7 says, And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his hand. The Hebrew word that is translated as held up is room. He lifted up his hand. When Daniel uses the word room in 12, verse 7, 11, 36, and 11, 12, he uses the word room 
to say lift up and exalt. And by the way, the primary definition of room in the Hebrew language is to lift up and exalt. The other place where he uses room is in Daniel 8, verse 11. If you believe that the daily in the book of Daniel represents the ministry of Christ in the sanctuary above, which is the standard teaching in Adventism today, in opposition to the pioneer position of the daily, then you find that in verse 11, the theologians, the majority of the theologians in Adventism today teach that verse 11 is dealing with the papacy. They're saying verse 11 is dealing with the papacy, and they say this, Yea, he, yea, the papacy, magnified himself to Christ, the prince of the host, and by him, by the papacy, and this word by is better translated through, and through the papacy, through him, the daily, the work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary is roomed. Now they say room means to remove. That the papacy, through the introduction of its worship style, the mass, in the, you know, in the time period of the mystery of iniquity till, till the papacy was established, as they introduced the introduction of ma mass, that this false teaching removed the understanding of Christ's work in the sanctuary from the minds of men. By the way, by the way, the word sir, that does mean remove, that is used in the two other places where the daily is mentioned, in 11 and 31. When sir is used in the Bible, it's only used to describe a physical removing. I remove this podium from here to here. I sir it. I sir it to here. It's never used to describe a removal in a metaphysical nature that somehow I remove that thought from your mind, okay? Of course, that's what's taught about this removal, this taking away of Christ's ministry in the sanctuary. It's taught that the false institution of the papacy removed the understanding of Christ's work in the sanctuary from the minds of men, but sir is never used that way. But room is not talking about removal. When Daniel talks about room, He's in agreement with the definition of room, which is lift up and exalt. So if verse 11 of Daniel 8 is dealing with the papacy, I don't believe it is. Pioneers don't believe it is. Here's what it would say. Yea, the papacy magnified itself to Christ, and through the papacy, the work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary was lifted up and exalted. Is there a time in history when the papacy lifted up and exalted the work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary? Never happened. Never happened. That's how Daniel uses the word. And then it says this, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Now, brothers and sisters, the Bible says upon the testimony of two things established. This verse does not say his sanctuary was cast down, does it? It says the place of his sanctuary. Where's the place of God's sanctuary? Now it's in heaven, right? So is there a verse in the Bible, show me, other than Daniel 8, 11, show me a verse in the Bible where the papacy casts down heaven. Where is that? Tell me where the other verse in the Bible is where the papacy casts down heaven. So that's what this verse is saying. The place of God's sanctuary, the heavenly sanctuary, which is in heaven, that place, heaven, was cast down by the papacy. If that's how you understand the verse, show me another verse in the Bible where heaven is cast down. There isn't one, brothers and sisters. Of course, that's not how the pioneers understood it. The pioneers understood it this way, that the daily represented paganism and that room means to lift up and exalt and that verse 11 is identifying pagan Rome. And it says this, Yea, he, pagan Rome, magnified himself, pagan Rome magnified himself against the prince of the host, Christ. Everybody agrees with that. Pagan Rome magnified itself at Christ at his birth when it tried to kill him, and at his death when it put him on the cross. Pagan, pagan Rome magnified himself to Christ. And through pagan Rome, paganism, 
the daily paganism, was lifted up and exalted. Now, brothers and sisters, was Babylon a pagan country? Yes. Was the Medes and Persians pagan? Was Greece pagan? Do we call it pagan Babylon? Do we call it pagan Medo-Persia? Do we call it pagan Greece? What do we call Rome? Pagan Rome. Why do we call pagan Rome? Pagan Rome. Because Rome is the power in history that is noted for lifting up and exalting paganism. That's why it's called pagan Rome. How did pagan Rome historically lift up and exalt paganism? How did they do this? Anyone know that story? Pardon me? Ah, okay, she knows that story. Where's the most famous temple of paganism in antiquity? It's in the city of Rome. What's the name of it? The Pantheon Temple in the city of Rome. What's Pantheon mean? Temple of the gods. As pagan Rome conquered the world, it had a custom that it always did. If it conquered a country that was worshiping some pagan deity that currently was not already worshiped in Rome, then pagan Rome would take the idols of that sanctuary and the priest of that sanctuary, and they would take them back to the city of Rome, and they would build a new addition in the temple called the Pantheon, and they would set up those priests with their own little niche where they could continue to worship that style of paganism. And that is the history of how pagan Rome is noted by the historians and by the pioneers of Adventism as lifting up and exalting paganism. But the verse says, the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And the sanctuary of pagan Rome, by the way, notice verse 13 and 14. Verse 13 says, Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary, notice that word sanctuary, and the host to be trodden underfoot. Notice verse 14, And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Brothers and sisters, in verse 13 and 14, what do you suppose the Hebrew word translated as sanctuary is? It's Kodesh. It's the word that can only be God's sanctuary. That's verses 13 and 14. And two verses before, in verse 11, it says the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Now, if you believe the daily is Christ's work in the sanctuary above, then you would believe this word sanctuary in verse 11 is identifying God's sanctuary. And you have to answer the question, why does Daniel use Makdesh in verse 11? because he's making a distinction between the sanctuary in verse 11 and the sanctuary in verses 13 and 14. And the sanctuary in verses 13 and 14 can only be God's sanctuary. And for Daniel to make a distinction two verses before in the same flow of thought with the Hebrew word that can also be a pagan sanctuary tells you that this isn't God's sanctuary. So the pioneers would tell you that verse 11 was this. Yay, pagan Rome. Magnet fight himself against Christ at his birth and his death. And through pagan Rome, paganism, the daily, was lifted up and exalted. And the place of pagan Rome's sanctuary, the city of Rome, where the Pantheon temple existed, was cast down by Constantine in the year 330 when he chose the city of Constantinople above the city of Rome as the capital of his empire. And brothers and sisters, this truth, of the place of his sanctuary, it connects with all kinds of passages in the Bible. The place of this sanctuary is the city of Rome. And there are several verses where it is described that pagan Rome cast down, disregarded, eliminated the city of Rome as the capital of its empire. That's what Revelation 13 too is. The dragon gave him his power, his seat, his greatest story. It cast down the city of Rome. Brothers and sisters, I don't think Daniel makes mistakes. I don't think there's any accidents in God's word. The fact that Daniel uses two different Hebrew words for sanctuary and two different Hebrew words that gets translated as take away is telling us that Daniel is placing a specific distinction on these words. On these words. That, that, that's how I understand it. 
If, uh, when Sister White says, we'll keep it simple. This seems simple to me. This is early writings, page 74. <coughs> I have seen that the 1843 chart, which identifies right here, the taking away of the daily as 508, and the understanding of these brethren that put this chart together was that by the year 508, the seven European kings had changed the legal profession of their countries from the religion of paganism to the religion of Catholicism. By the year 508, paganism had been taken away. It had been removed. That's on this chart. Sister White says, I have seen that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord, and it should not be altered that the figures were as he wanted them, that his hand was over and hid a mistake in some of the figures so that none could see it until his hand was removed. Now notice this next argument I want to throw into the mix, if you will. Then I saw in relation to the daily that the word sacrifice was supplied by man's wisdom. Now I hope we all understand that in the King James Bible that when you see a word in italics, that means it's a word that was added by the translators. It's not in the original text. Look at your King James Bible sometime. How many added words are there in the King James Bible? Many, many, many. That's the best answer. It's, it's up there. There are so many added words in the King James Bible. So here's, here's what she says. I, then I saw that in relation to the daily, that the word sacrifice was supplied by man's wisdom and does not belong to the text. So I ask you, how many added words, supplied words in the Bible does inspiration tell us don't belong there? How many? How many times does the Sp Spirit of the Lord, through Ellen White, say, I want you to understand that this added word in the Bible doesn't belong there? One time. One time. One time. It says, when it comes to the daily, the word sacrifice should not be there. Now, brothers and sisters, what's taught in Adventism today is that the daily represents Christ's work in the heavenly sanctuary. If the daily represents Christ's work in the heavenly sanctuary, then the added word sacrifice is logical. It's supportive. It's consistent with that teaching. Christ's work in the sanctuary has to do with his sacrifice and his sacrificial service that's being accomplished up there, correct? Correct? So why would inspiration say, when it comes to the daily... The word sacrifice doesn't belong there. A brother here brought up that uh, the subject of the daily in the, in, the, in the Bible, that someone had been showing him that you know, the, the daily has this connection with the sanctuary in the Bible, and it does, it does. The word daily, continual in the Hebrew, is used many times in connection with the sanctuary. There's, there's one distinction you need to understand, though. When the daily is used in the Bible, it's a verb. That's a basic. I'm not a linguist. That's a basic. It's a verb. It's the, the daily offering, the continual offering, except in the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, the daily is a noun. It's a subject. It's different. It's a symbol. It's different. Daniel was using it as a symbol. But Sister White says here now, then I saw in relation to the daily that the word sacrifice was supplied by man's wisdom and does not belong to the text, and that the Lord... Now notice, this, this is the part that's easy for me. She's speaking about the daily, and she says that the Lord gave the correct view of it to those who gave the judgment hour cry. Who was it that gave the judgment hour cry? William Miller, Joseph Bates, Loughborough, James White, Andrews and others all taught that the daily represented paganism. And Ellen White says the Lord gave the correct view of the daily to those men. And here at the end of the world, we throw that all away. We throw it all away, brothers and sisters. And in throwing it all away, we have to insist that the word rum has the same definition as the word sir, and the word makdesh has the same definition as the word kodesh. Why did Daniel make a distinction if that were the case? Brothers and sisters, it don't hold water. It don't hold water. It wasn't until 1901 that this view came into Adventism. 
came in through a man named Conradi. If you're new in Adventism or not that familiar with Adventism, there are certain people in Adventism that have apostatized, that become historical figures of apostasy in Adventism. Conradi is one of them. Conradi, when he apostatized from Adventism, rejected the sanctuary doctrine, rejected Ellen White, and before he left the work, he is the one that has caused the European Adventists to basically have no confidence in the spirit of prophecy. And anyone that is fair with history will say that is a correct evaluation of the fruits of Conradi. And Conradi introduced this view to Wagner in the 1901 time period, and Wagner brought it back, and Daly, Daly, Daniels and Prescott accepted this view and began to promote it in Adventism. And it caused a shaking. Sister White died in 1915. 1931, Daniels said, you know, back in the time period when the daily controversy was, was going on in Adventism, in 1911, I had an interview with Ellen White on the daily. And she said that my understanding of the daily was correct. That was 1931 that Daniels said that. From that point on, everyone accepted Conradi's and Daly's and Daniel's view of the daily that it represented the work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. But you know what? In 1911, there was a, a man named F.C. Gilbert who was a convert to Adventism. He was a Jew. He was like Glenn, except he was a real Jew. He knew the Hebrew. He could speak and read Hebrew, and he defended the pioneer position of the daily from the Hebrew language in the time period when Daniels and Prescott were promoting Conradi's view of the daily. He was the premier champion of defending the pioneer position during that time period, and he was doing it from the Hebrew of Daniel, because he knew it. And you know what he said? He said, I had an interview with Ellen White in 1911 and discussed the subject of the daily. Same year that Daniels claims he had an interview. In 1911, F.C. Gilbert recorded what his interview was about. And, and, and you can look at it. I'm going to give you some of the things he said about that interview in 1911. It's, it's a, in the record. He says that Ellen White told him that Daniel's position of the daily, Christ, work in the heavenly sanctuary, was from the devil. And that Daniel's and Prescott needed to be reconverted. And that, uh, a couple other of the phrases, that, that the Lord had forbidden Ellen White to interview Daniels. So, he put that in the record in the same year he had the interview. Twenty years later, Daniels said he had an interview with Ellen White in 1911, where she confirmed that his position of the daily was correct, and from that point on, Adventism has accepted and promoted this view of the daily. But in the 1980s, the Adventist Church published some books of unpublished manuscripts by Ellen White. They're called manuscript releases. I think there's 20 in the volume. Just how many? 21 of old manuscripts. And you know what? There was a manuscript from that very time period when the daily was going on. And Sister White says the same things in that manuscript that F.C. Gilbert said in his evaluation of his interview with Ellen White in 1911. She says more than once, the Lord forbid me to see Daniels. She says that Daniels was here to interview on the daily. But, but 1931, 16 years after Ellen White died, Daniels said, I interviewed her that year, and she confirmed my position was right. Is this a hard truth? Agent Daniels was general conference president for a long time. Is this, is this kind of critical to be saying these things about someone this long after the fact? Maybe. But this is a historical fact. You can read it in manuscript releases. She said that Daniels had no right to be promoting his ideas of the daily and that if ever men needed to be reconverted, it was Daniels and Prescott and that Daniels should not continue as general conference president any longer. She says when Daniel was lifting up and advocating his ideas of the daily, the results were shown to me and they would bring confusion and darkness to God's people. That's her words. But in 1980, the majority of Adventists don't care one way or another about the daily. And that manuscript lays there. 
And in 1980s, you'd already had 50 years of the theologians promoting Conradi's view, the old Protestant view, of the daily, and it becomes an established fact. Now, brothers and sisters, what we studied earlier today is that this history and these truths in Revelation chapter 10, verse 4, what happened to these truths in this history? They were sealed up. And how does Sister White say things are sealed up? by customs and traditions that are handed down from generation to generation. So, Sister White says, in that time period when the controversy was going on, that, that she didn't think that this was a, you know, I forget how she says it, you know, a, a testing truth, that's her word, a testing truth. I, I, don't, I don't disagree with that. I don't think the daily is a testing truth, particularly when she said it. But brothers and sisters, in the 1901 to 1915 time period, this was uh, 75 years before the collapse of the Soviet Union and the fulfillment of verse 40. 75 years before verses 40 and 45 began to be fulfilled. The subject of the daily is not a test question. But now that we're at the end of the world and the last six verses of Daniel have begun to unfold, and Sister White tells us that if you want to understand the last six verses of Daniel 11, then understand that the history of verses 30 to 36 of Daniel 11 will be repeated in that fulfillment. And those verses include the history of the daily. Suddenly, who, who what the daily is becomes more relevant and important in this time period than it was when Sister White said she was shown that this isn't a test question. By the way, Sister White how many of you are familiar with the Seventh-day Adventist reform movement? There are certain things that they do that are a direct contradiction with the writings of Ellen White. One of those things is, is Sister White says the health message should never be a test of fellowship. Have you seen that quote before? The health message should never be a test of fellowship. Seventh-day Adventist reform movement makes it a test of fellowship. Sister White also says all those that continue the use of flesh foods will go out from among us. So is health reform a test question? This is, in perspective, it depends on how you're looking at it, brothers and sisters. What is a test question? It needs to be considered time and circumstance and place. Brothers and sisters, what the daily is, is much more significant now than it was during that controversy. And there's more that can be said about it. That's the lead into it. But let's go to page 76, verse 31. And arms, the, se the military economic strength of the seven European kings shall stand on his part. They shall stand up for the papacy, and then they will do three things. They shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. Brothers and sisters, this sanctuary is not Kodesh. It's Makdesh. It's a sanctuary that is either God's sanctuary or a pagan sanctuary. And the pioneers identify that the strength of pagan Rome was the city of Rome. In fact, uh, the city of Rome ruled the world supremely from the year 31 B.C. until the year 330 in fulfillment of a time prophecy in Daniel 11, 24. Uriah Smith speaks about this in his book. You can see it there. This isn't my idea. That's a 360-year time prophecy that the pagan Rome ruled the world supremely. And Uriah Smith comments on it, and he comments on that verse. It's saying that verse said they would rule the world supremely from the city of Rome. When pagan Rome had the city of Rome as the capital of its empire, it was invincible. It was its sanctuary of strength. But when Constantine moved the capital to Constantinople in the year 330, the Roman Empire began to crumble and disintegrate. Prophetically, the city of Rome is the strength of Rome. And verse 31 says the arms, the seven European kings, were going to pollute the sanctuary of strength. And brothers and sisters, from the year 330 until 538, as the seven trumpets begin to go blow, the first trumpet uh, being uh, Odi Alaric, the second trumpet being Genseric, the third trumpet being Attila the Hun, the fourth trumpet being Odiacer, read it in Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith. 
Those powers, those barbarians that came out of the nor northern Europe and out of Africa and began to take the Roman Empire apart, in that warfare that was waged against those seven European kings, what was the point of attack? What were they going for? What was the goal? It was the city of Rome. And from this time period of uh, from 330 till 538, the warfare that was taking the Roman Empire apart was destroying the city of Rome. And that's why verse 31 says, An arm shall stand up for the papacy, and they shall pollute, they shall destroy the city of Rome in the warfare that ensues during that time period. That's how the pioneers understood it. Makes sense to me. And it says, They shall take away. And this take away is sir. It means remove. They shall take away paganism. The word sacrifice doesn't belong there. And from 496, these arms, these seven European kings, one by one changed the legal religion of their religion, of their countries, from paganism to Catholicism. And by the year 508, paganism, the daily, had been taken away. You know something? When you go into this study, you can find several historical references the pioneers used to prove that paganism was taken away by the year 508. What is the highest form of worship service in the religion of paganism? It's an easy one. It's also the highest form of worship service in Catholicism. What did you say? Human sacrifice. Human sacrifice is the height of Worship in paganism and Catholicism. The highest celebration of all the celebrations in the Catholic Church is the celebration that takes place as a heretic is burning or dying in punishment for being a heretic. Pioneers point out that the historians point out that by the year 508, paganism as a religion in Europe was so restrained that no human sacrifices took place after 508 in the worship of paganism. They also point out that all the European kings had changed the legal profession of their country. Uh, you read Uriah Smith. He talks about a, a riot that took place in Constantinople. And what I'm saying is this, brothers and sisters, when it comes to 508 being the date that paganism was removed from the seven European kings that were still left after the three horns were plucked up, they turn to historical source after historical source. But when you come to identifying the daily as the work of Christ in the sanctuary above, you know what historical source uh, those men turned to to identify the year 508? There isn't one. There isn't one. So suddenly, what the pioneers taught about 508, you have no historical reference to uphold it. And what they understood about Daniel 12 and, and uh, Rev Daniel 11... 31, and it just comes tumbling down. So they're going to remove paganism, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate, the papacy. This they did in 538. So you have a summary of what we've just went over. Um, after, on page 76, arms shall stand in his part from 496 to 508 and beyond. The military and economic support of the seven European kings took up the work of establishing the papacy on the throne of the earth. You see the summary. So the sequence. Now let's move it forward a step. For some of you that came this afternoon, you don't necessarily understand the, the intent of these studies. Um, we believe that the last six verses of Daniel 11 is the present truth message for the hour. On that cabinet back there, you'll see a magazine titled The Time of the End. It gives a simple, not complete, a simple overview of Daniel 11, 40 to 45. It will give you an understanding of what we understand the present truth message to be for this time period. And this particular presentation this weekend is um, way above the foundational study. We're doing some things that are beyond a simple, basic overview of Daniel 11, 40 to 45. And we're making the assumption, even though I know it is not going to hold true, we're making the assumption that those that are listening here today and those that may listen to this on audio tape or DVD will be familiar with what we're suggesting about the last six verses of Daniel 11. And I know that's not the case, but we still have to deal with some of these 
more mature concepts. So what we're saying here is that that history of verses 30 and 31 and then 32 and onward is describing persecution, that those scenes, as the pioneers understood them correctly, are going to reflect the scenes that took place, that take place in the last six verses of Daniel 11. And we're, we teach that verse 40 describes the war between atheism and Catholicism that began in 1798. When atheistic France delivered the deadly wound to the papacy, atheistic France, atheism, is the king of the south. The papacy is the king of the north in the verse. But as time evolves, another power that dominates the philosophy of atheism comes into history, that power being the Soviet Union, and that verse 40 is describing an alliance between the United States and the Vatican that took place in the Ronald Reagan years and brought down the king of the south, atheism, in 1989. And that verse 41 is the next event, which is a Sunday law in the United States. And verse 42 and 43 is describing when the papacy takes control of the entire world, when the ten kings of Revelation 17 agree to give their kingdom, the one world government that we know as the United Nations, to the beast. After verses 42 and 43, when the papacy has conquered Egypt, the world, and all the countries of the world, then we see the warfare, the persecution illustrated, and in verse 45, the papacy comes to his end and none shall help. So how does that understanding of these verses, and that's a simple overview, how does that understanding of these verses align with the history of verses 30 to 36? The first thing in verse 30 that we pointed out is that there was an intelligence that took place between pagan Rome, the power that was going to place the papacy on the throne of the earth, and papal Rome. Verse 30, the end of verse 30. And we're suggesting that pagan Rome, as the power that places the papacy on the throne of the earth, is a type of the United States, because at the end of the world, the United States places the papacy on the throne of the earth. And when we deal with Daniel 11, 40 to 45 in depth, we always have a, um, a videotape of an interview between Larry King and Carl Bernstein, where, he, where Carl Bernstein wrote a book on how the United States and the Vatican formed a secret alliance to bring down the Soviet Union. And in the book and in that interview, Carl Bernstein is clear that when the secret alliance was formed between Ronald Reagan and the Vatican, that they had a secret envoy that went back and forth between Washington, D.C. and Rome and kept the communications going. And do you, who was the secret envoy? His name was Casey. He was the head of the Central Intelligence Agency. There was intelligence that took place between the United States and Rome to start this sequence of events. And the history of verse 30 was an intelligence that took place between pagan Rome and papal Rome. I don't believe it's an accident that the institution that was the conveyor of this intelligence was the Central Intelligence Agency. That was the secret alliance. And it says, but arms, the power that's going to place the papacy on the throne of the world is going to stand up for the papacy. And sure enough, the military and economic strength of the United States was used for the papacy to bring down the king of the south in 1989. And the sequence was underway. Now, brothers and sisters, this is a little bit deeper truth. It's, it can be defended, but I'm going to give it to you simple. We will defend it as we move on. Bible prophecy teaches that the strength of Rome was the city of Rome. What made Rome strong was the city of Rome. Prophetically, when pagan Rome ruled from the city of Rome, they were invincible. When the papacy controlled the city of Rome, it was invincible. It wasn't until the Goths were driven out of the city of Rome that the papacy was established in 538, and they ruled the world until the pope was taken out of the city of Rome. In prophecy, what makes Rome strong is the city of Rome. And there's something in prophecy that makes the United States strong. It's its sanctuary of strength. What's the sanctuary of strength, prophetically, that makes the United States strong? Sister White's clear about this. The Constitution of the United States. 
And the history that Sister White points to says that the power that's going to place the papacy on the throne of the earth, it's going to pollute, destroy its sanctuary of strength. And brothers and sisters, in verse 41 at the Sunday Law in the United States, the sanctuary of strength, the thing that makes the United States strong, is going to be polluted. That history, that history is right on the money. And they're going to remove the daily. Clovis is an example. Clovis, the king of France, converted to Catholicism in 496. There are many parallels between Clovis and Ronald Reagan. I'll give you one of them. Clovis was a pagan. He was in a battle that he couldn't win. He didn't think he could win. His wife was a Catholic. Her name was Clotilda. And in the middle of the battle, he cried out, Oh, God of Clotilda, if you'll give me this ba battle, I'll become a Catholic. And the battle turned, and Clovis became a Catholic, had his whole army baptized. Such a crowd around when Clovis was being baptized that the priests couldn't get in to the cathedral to baptize Clovis. And a dove came down out of heaven with a jar of oil to anoint Clovis. That's a story. I don't believe it either. But that's a story. Catholicism understands that. Do you realize that Pope John Paul II in 1996 made a special pilgrimage to France to celebrate 1,500 years since Clovis stood up for the papacy. Catholicism knows about 496, even if Adventists don't. And one of the things that Clovis did on a very simple level is he had been a pagan, and he changed his prof religious profession from paganism to Catholicism. Brothers and sisters, the United States, in prophecy, is a Protestant nation. It don't matter if you have a Catholic dictionary or a Protestant dictionary. There is only one definition for Protestant, to protest Rome. And when Ronald Reagan formed a secret alliance with the Antichrist of Bible prophecy, the United States ceased to be a Protestant nation because the Bible says, can two walk together unless they be agreed? And the religious profession of the United States prophetically changed from Protestant to apostate Protestantism, paralleling what took place with Clovis. The daily was removed, and then the papacy is placed on the throne of the earth, and then a blood bath broke out. And brothers and sisters, the history we're suggesting for the last six verses of Daniel 11 parallels the history of verses 30, 36, right on the money, if, if you retain the pioneer understanding of the daily. If you don't, if you don't, that history is turned upside down, and suddenly you don't have a pattern for the final fulfillment of Daniel 11. That's why we're going to deal a little bit with the daily as we proceed. And that's why, and all that is in your notes, that's why I may seem to be a little bit too aggressive on the daily when there are statements by Ellen White that when it comes to the subject of the daily, silence is golden or that we shouldn't discuss the subject of the daily. Read those passages closely. More than once, she says, in the current situation, or at this present time, the daily shouldn't be discussed. This is a different situation. And when it comes to her saying, on the subject of the, the daily, silence is eloquence, you read it, and almost every time, she's speaking to Daniels and Prescott. They were teaching the wrong view. She was telling them specifically, you need to shut up. And she was telling the people that were opposing them, the best plan of attack here on this subject is let's just drop the subject. They're in the minority. Maybe they'll drop the subject and we can keep moving forward united. So yeah, she has statements where she says on the subject, silence is eloquence. But brothers and sisters, time and circumstances need to be considered when you read the writings of the spirit of prophecy. Or it would be a sin to own a bicycle, right? Sister White said, we should not be buying bicycles. When bicycles first came into history, they were costing two and three months wages for one bicycle. But how many Seventh-day Adventist missionaries are carrying the gospel message on bicycles today? Time and circumstances need to be considered when we are considering the history of Adventism. And brothers and sisters, the daily is a subject we need to understand if we're going to understand the last six verses of Daniel 11. And we need to understand it correctly, but it has been covered up by traditions and customs that have been passed down by generation to generation. And Jesus is attempting to unseal this truth at this time.
Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we, we want to be among those that are the wise, that understand the increase of knowledge at the end of time correctly. We also know that the wise represent teachers. We ask that you give us the ability to understand this message in a way that we can share it convincingly to others and then open the doors that we might be about our business of sharing this message, that the process of giving would allow us to be blessed with further light, further strengthening to stand during a time period when there will be no intercession for sin. We know that time period is coming at blinding speed and as Laodiceans, it's difficult for us to awaken ourselves to this reality, but we ask you once again to do so. Awaken us to our personal responsibility that we might be used by you to awaken our loved ones around us. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs>